I don't think anyone knows this, but the Honda City Hybrid has a soft spot in my heart. It was actually the very first assignment on the very first day when I joined the Paulton.org crew, which was about four years ago, so time flies. Today, we're taking a look at the all-new Honda City Hybrid. Is it better? And has Honda done any good with the new IMMD hybrid drive system? And should you pick one up at the current SST-free price of 106,000 ringgit? Let's find out. That's right, my friends. Honda Malaysia is asking for 106,000 ringgit for this city hybrid, and it's about 20,000 ringgit more than the CTV. That is a big jump compared to the positioning of the City Sport Hybrid IDCD from four years back, where it was priced at just under 90,000 ringgit, which is below the CTV. This time around, the hybrid is the range topper, so that's a big shift in Honda Malaysia's product strategy. After all, the hybrid usually appeals to the thinking buyer, you know, the kind of person who is more analytical when it comes to purchasing a high-tech vehicle such as this. As the range topper, the City Hybrid is the only one dressed in the sporty RS trim, which comes with a blacked out solid wing face with mesh intakes, sportier fog lamp trims, faux carbon fiber print on the lower lip, black side mirror caps, body colored door handles, 16 inch diamond cut dual tone alloy wheels, a gloss black rear spoiler, blue accented Honda badges, an RS badge at the front and back, plus a fake carbon fiber rear diffuser. The City Hybrid is also the only variant to get four disc brakes, whereas the non-hybrid range, they all get a set of rotors up front and a set of drums at the back. Otherwise, it's pretty much identical to the City V. Inside, it gets red contrast stitching on the steering wheel, dash trim and seats, red LED accents for the AC dials, brushed metal foot pedals, electronic parking brake switch, and black headlining, just like BMW M Sport models. The steering wheel has additional buttons here for the Honda sensing system, and unique to the city hybrid only is this part digital, part analog instrumentation, with the analog part of the gauge looking a little bit more basic than the one on the city V. What's nice here is the 7-inch display on the left, giving you an assortment of information from power and charge levels, drivetrain action, fuel economy, and various other in-car settings. It's pretty sweet. If you haven't noticed yet, the rear seatbelt warning or the seatbelt indicator is positioned here for the non-hybrid variants. But because this has a digital screen, all that has been integrated here, which is really a nice touch, freeing up a little bit of space so you can do stuff like this. Fit a tall flask or water bottle without anything to block it. That's pretty nice. I've touched on a number of things on the interior, you know, stuff I like, stuff I don't, in my review of the CTV. So if you want to watch that video, uh, you can go ahead and see my take on the things that I like. But for this, I'll just sum it up very briefly for you. There are no changes to seating comfort other than design, so they are all great and the amount of space offered is identical. The head unit is the same 8-inch display with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and the 8 standard speakers actually sound pretty great, not gonna lie. There's a slight revision here in the center tunnel from using this parking switch, but otherwise, there are no other changes. The door panel design still looks meh, no auto up down function for all windows, no vanity lights, no LED interior lighting, and no electrochromic rear view mirror. The CTRS is also the first Honda model to feature Honda Connect, so you can do a bunch of things from your smartphone like climate preconditioning or remote engine start. Just to quickly show you the rear seating position, like I said earlier, nothing is compromised here. You still get the full whack of the B-Segment King, that is the space that you get back here with the city, despite the extra hybrid components. So that's really good. You feel very spacious sitting back here. Uh, the seating position is actually very comfortable and you have a lot of space to move your legs, your shoulders, and maybe your head. Lah, huh? Otherwise, it's pretty much identical to the rest. With air vents here, power sockets down there, and a center armrest here with twin cubby holes. All good. 
Instead, the boot space is slightly smaller now because of the replacement of the lithium ion battery. So the total volume is 409 liters instead of 519. There's no spare tire as well, only a tire repair kit. But hey, at least you still get to fold the rear seats. So that's something. Before we talk about the drive experience, I want to explain to you a little bit about IMMD, this whole hybrid drive system, because I think it's an important piece of technology that you should understand. IMMD stands for Intelligent Multimode Drive, and I'll say this very superficially. It's like driving an electric car, like a full electric car, with the engine acting as a backup generator to charge the battery. So it's never, for the most part, going to provide direct drive to the front wheels but i'll explain all that in like a minute or so the immd system comprises an engine a lithium-ion battery and two electric motors one of them is called the motor generator unit which is the smaller of the two electric motors and it's connected directly to the petrol engine it acts as a starter motor that can also channel electrical energy that is generated mechanically by the engine to the lithium-ion battery at the back. Its secondary function is also to transmit some of the electrical energy to the larger motor, which is called the traction motor. Now, the traction motor is going to be the primary source of propulsion for this car, like almost exclusively, except when you're cruising. So it makes the headline figure like, yeah, the whole 109 PS and 253 Newton meters of torque. Now, Honda says 253 Newton meters, makes it about as powerful as the Toyota Camry, so make of that what you will. Uh, again, I'll talk about how it, the performance feels in the real world a little bit later after I explain IMMD. Now, in the world of hybrid systems, IMMD is actually a very different animal compared to even Honda's previous hybrid system, the IDCD Sport Hybrid, and all the other electrified cars like the Audi A6 Hybrid, as well as the BMW. 330e because those systems typically employ this sandwich system where they take uh, the electric motor and put it right between the engine and the transmission so it replaces the torque converter part of the transmission IMMD on the other hand does not have a transmission in the traditional sense not even a belt and pulley CVT that powers most other modern Hondas instead like an electric car there's only a single speed transmission or rather a single gear ratio to regulate the traction motor which can spin up to 13,300 rpm. So for most of your urban driving scenarios, the traction motor is going to be doing all the heavy lifting. So 60, 80, maybe even 100 kilometers per hour while the engine just continuously charges the battery pack. The battery itself is not a very big or dense unit. It's probably within the realms of one kilowatt hour and this is done so it doesn't add too much weight to the car's overall system and on a full charge at best you can get about two kilometers of pure ev driving without the engine ever coming to life but i think that is as far as you get with a full charge again immd stands for multi-mode drive which primarily has three drive modes and you can't switch between the three at your wheel it, it does so automatically via the power control unit so you have EV drive for most of your driving scenarios. You've got engine drive for cruising like I am right now. And you also have hybrid drive that gives you the maximum burst of energy for when you want to overtake or when you're climbing up a steep hill or something like that. When you're cruising on a highway at say 100 or 110 kilometers per hour, the engine takes over propulsion duties. So the engine provides direct mechanical source of power to the front wheels and it does so at a fixed ratio this ratio is more or less like uh, the six speed or the six gear on an automatic transmission so it's tallest ratio but it's also the most efficient ratio the engine which is a 1.5 liter atkinson cycle engine only makes about 98 ps and 127 newton meters of torque so it's very much less powerful than the regular uh, iv tag unit that you find in the non-hybrid version but it also explains why, with a single speed or a single fixed ratio, it can only go out to a top speed of 177 km per hour versus the 195 on the non-hybrid variant. You see, 
IMMD is not the performance hybrid that you have been led to believe. Sure, it makes big numbers, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a much bigger tree hugger compared to the Honda Sport IDCD system, which had a physical 7-speed dry dual clutch transmission and a sport mode switch. Here, you only get an econ button instead of the sport mode, and the pedal shift this year lets you cycle between three incrementally aggressive levels of regenerative braking and not to change gears. <laughs> Nissan's e-power hybrid system is probably the closest thing to this IMMD system. In fact, I would call them direct rivals if not for the slight difference which is e-power system uses the traction motor or the electric motor 100% of the time and the engine which is typically a smaller 1.2 litre engine functions primarily as a generator to recharge the battery which is typically in an e-power configuration bigger than what you get with this IMMD system. Lah. In mixed driving conditions, I managed to get about 3.8 litres per 100 kilometres or about 26 kilometre per litre of fuel. That's actually pretty good, but I am very confident that I can get even better mileage if I had more time to test the car. This pretty much makes it more economical than the previous IDCD system. When you're idling, you'll hear the engine switch on and off fairly regularly. You know, it has to charge the battery quite frequently. But when you're driving on the highway, the switch is fairly imperceptible. It's very smooth, very refined, and you really can't tell. It's non-intrusive at all. For maximum acceleration, the engine will supply additional electrical energy to the traction motor, giving you the full 109 PS and 253 Nm of torque. And it takes a bit of time to get full acceleration. So let me just demonstrate it once again. I'll slow down to probably about 80. And then I'll press the pedal like full on. 3, 2, 1. So you see, it takes a full second. It's like a turbo lag of sorts before it starts accelerating. I think the whole process of getting the engine to send electrical juice to the traction motor and drawing some of that from the battery is causing a bit of the delay. But again, it doesn't work like a typical hybrid would. So you just have to get used to it. It's slightly different. Now the IMMD hybrid system adds only about 120 kilograms to the overall weight of the city rs over the base city but it still does the 0 to 100 slightly quicker uh, doing it in 9.9 seconds versus 10.2 seconds for the city s and e and 10.4 seconds for the ctv but if you ask me i think the performance of the rs is very negligible it doesn't feel as fast as the 1.5 liter dohc engine but to me at the end of the day they feel pretty much the same in the way of output tire raw as you can probably tell from the odd 10 minutes or so of driving, is just as terrible as the non-hybrid variant. And it handles more or less the same as well. Sure, ride is a little bit more solid compared to the previous city hybrid, with secondary ride observably more matured. So it's more solid all around. It's still torsion beam at the back, by the way. Like before, Honda nailed the brake feel, so brake modulation feels very natural almost like a non-hybrid car. So that is something Honda has excelled in for the past few years with its hybrid cars. The fact that Honda Sensing is available on the city for the first time is massive news because it sets the stage for everyone else to follow. It's obviously the class leader in terms of safety features, you know, having features like adaptive cruise control, AEB with nighttime pedestrian detection. It also detects cyclists, but only during the day. And then there's lane centering assist, but all that without low speed follow. So it's not quite the level two self-driving or semi-autonomous driving system that you would get with a Proton X50. But you know, to have all this in a B-segment sedan is unheard of. In my brief testing with the Honda Sensing system, I feel like they are all very refined, you know, as refined as they come. So I've got no complaints there. So, based on the lengthy IMMD explanation, do you think this car warrants the 20,000 ringgit premium over the CDV? Honestly, I personally don't think so. But then again, this is the closest thing to an electric car that you can get for the money. 
Like I said earlier in the video, this car will surely appeal to the thinking buyer, the kind that values technology and safety more so than outright performance and bragging rights. So if you're looking for something unique in this segment, this might just be it. But at 106,000 ringgit, it's a bit of a tough pill for me to swallow.